good afternoon, folks. Um, today is the afternoon. It's 1.52, September 21st um, here in Florida, uh, 2012. And uh, my name is Thomas Keegan, again, with LibertarianProgressive.com. Uh, this isn't just for Florida, though, folks. I mean, this we're doing interviews with independent third-party candidates across the country that are on the ballots and have a chance to win. Um, a lot of people might have in their strategy to not vote as a way to send a message to the politicians. I would agree to a point of not voting, but um, but I would continue to say for a Democrat or a Republican, um, uh, they do have a 10% approval rating, and I think there is a good reason why. Um, not to say there isn't some that could be good here and there, but I'm thinking about an idea of uh, what, it, you know, Think of the benefits of electing as many independent third-party candidates and then possibly getting 50. And um, right now I'm looking at a website. It's called VoteGilmore.com, V-O-T-E-G-I-L-L-M-O-R.com. And um, it's Richard H. Gilmore for District 8, who's running against um, uh, Bill Posey, the Republican, Shannon Roberts, the Democrat. And not only am I looking on the website, I have him on the line here with us, of course, conducting an interview. And so, uh, Richard, thank you for your time this Friday afternoon and um, and being also from uh, Florida, giving us um, here in the state uh, more options. Uh, please, sir, um, good to talk to you today. Please tell us a little bit about yourself, what got you motivated, and um, <clears throat> to, you know, like said, it is getting near crunch time. I mean, it's, we are about like 48 or 45 days away from the election or so, mm -hmm. close. And um, so, um, yeah, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, um, District 8, and what got you motivated, uh, sir? Sure. Thomas, uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, it, what got me motivated was really the same thing that got me motivated to run four years ago for city council. Um, I retired from um, <clears throat> a small business that I ran for quite a few years. Uh, I was in the insurance business for 14 years, and I retired in 2005 here in Sebastian. And we started uh, uh, watching the uh, city council on TV and uh, uh, it, it started out really good. We had a great mayor, and he had to leave, and things kind of degenerated to a point where in 2008, uh, 2007, I guess it was, the mayor at that time walked off the dais, uh, threw the gavel to the vice mayor, who didn't have a clue what to how to run a meeting, and uh, it just it had degenerated to just kind of a screaming match between the, uh, the, the uh, council members. So I said to myself, gee, I think I can do a better job than that. So I ran in 2008 and was elected and immediately made mayor. So <laughs> talk about a, a steep learning curve. You're, you're a private citizen one, one day, and then you, you get elected, and you're made mayor of a city of 23,000 the next. Um, but we were able to, s to settle everything down and uh, really proud of what we've done in the last four years. What I'm looking at now is the same condition up in Washington. The Democrats don't get along with the Republicans. The Republicans don't get along with the Democrats. Uh, it's nothing more than political theater. Um, you know, and I've been on several different uh, committees, chaired several committees, where we work with Democrats, Republicans, independents, and it's you have to work across the aisle. Good ideas come from both sides of the aisle. So. Uh, that's why I'm running. I just think I can do better than what's up there. Great, great. Well, that's excellent. I'm a mayor. Um, and were you um, part of the parties then when you were running for city council, or is that nonpartisan? And what well, about it's you? a nonpartisan position, but I was, uh, I'd registered uh, independent. I'd I registered uh, no political affiliation when we moved up here in 2005 because for 27 years in the Keys, uh, we lived down there. I was registered as a Democrat because uh, when we moved to Florida, it was solidly Democratic, the whole state. And the supervisor of elections says, well, if you want to be able to voice any opinion as to who your county commissioners are or your judges are, you better register Democratic. So I've always voted for the person you know, over the party. So it really didn't matter what I was registered because I'd, looked, I'd look at the individual people that I was voting for. Yeah. So when we moved up here, I said, well, you know, I'm really, I'm really an independent because I, I don't look at the party, I look at the people. So 
So I was registered for four, I guess, four or five years as a as a in, uh, independent NPA, and then uh, was registered Republican for three years. And then last year I got sick of that party and. <laughs> Re-registered as NPA. Yeah, I mean the parties are, um, you know, just kind of like a sort of a tool um, per se, and um, and even if we had no parties, I guess that would be similar to having just one party um, in a sense. And um, so it, it's there's a lot of different ways to look at it, but we definitely do need like some um, change going our way, and, um, and 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 not voting is an option. I, now, I can I, I and I bring that up because I mean honestly, about 50 percent of the people don't vote. And, and a lot of those people think they're sending a message by not voting. And I think I can understand that argument. I wanted to acknowledge it. Um, I want to disagree with it, but I do want to acknowledge that that's only going to work if everyone doesn't do it and if people also quit paying taxes, quit just participating in everything. But if the only good, thing good they point. do yep. is not vote, then it's just going to... I mean, the, the you know, someone will just appoint someone. I mean, it's not like there's going to be runoff elections in most places. And um, mm-hmm. and the person who wins, I mean, honestly, I, I don't know if some of these people have any shame or not. And uh, I don't think they would feel like a sense of shame that they won, no. uh, that they didn't even win. So um, now Bill Posey, I will say, like, I did look up part of his records. He, he did vote against, um, and I'm just going to bring on this one issue because it happened at the end of last year, the beginning of this year. He voted against the NDAA, which did take some um, principle or backbone to do it when it passed, and most people did vote for it, but um, he was one of the few. Um, but... Um, but it, would you say that, like, you would oppose, like, um, things that, um, you, you know, make people, um, uh, you know, be able to put away, especially American citizens, I suppose. Um, some could argue anybody, but, you know, indefinitely without um, any charges or knowing the crimes or accusers. Yeah, I sure would. And, in fact, uh, you know, he did vote against that. But uh, recently there was a, there was, uh, I'd say about three months ago, there maybe four months ago, he voted to put eight billion more on the defense budget, and that goes against what the uh, uh, sequestr- sequestration uh, was all about last year. Remember, the uh, super committee was supposed to come up with ways to cut the bu- budget, and they said, "Well, if we can't do that, then then we'll take it out of defense and, and social programs." And and so basically, the there was a defense authorization budget that came up, I think, in March or April. And uh, it, uh, the budget came up, and they, it actually threw $8 billion more into the defense for, uh, you know, missile defense and some other things that the Pentagon didn't even want. Um, and he voted for that. That's amazing. Uh, I, a lot of these budgets, like the, you hear in the news, the Pentagon doesn't even want this stuff. Right. And on top of that, <clears throat> here's the kicker. There was a, an amendment that I, that I believe came from the Democratic side. I'm not sure. But anyway, there was an amendment to that bill that would have gotten rid of the most onerous part of the uh, Patriot Act. And that's that, that clause where they can hold you incommunicado if they think you're a terrorist. If, they're, you know, if they think that you're a terrorist, it doesn't matter. You're an American citizen. You can be held uh, without uh, counsel. And uh, that just tramples over the uh, Constitution. I think it's the, the Fifth and the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution. Um, the, yes. the right for right, speedy trial and the right to an attorney and the right to be tried by your peers and all that. It's just that he voted against that amendment. So those are two votes I would have cast different. I wouldn't have thrown the extra $8 billion on the defense. And, you know, supposedly we're going to be working our way down to a peacetime uh, uh, military so why do we need a wartime budget? Yeah, and, and I mean, are we, here's, are we an empire? Um, are we the United Empire of America or the United States? Are we a republic? Is this um, the public, yeah. you know, for which it stands, the principles, um, you, you know, like habeas corpus and all the things that have evolved to give, give us some, um, uh, you, you know, that we take for granted now, I guess, the rights um, that we... Um, you know, have uh, guaranteed in our Bill of Rights and the whole Constitution, and um, and if they want to change that, that you know, they should have to pass an amendment. And it seems to work pretty good. I mean, it's not like um, you, you know, we we don't have the ability to prosecute people who are um, mm-hmm. you know evildoers and, and yeah. etc. Um, 
And, and so that let's go into the budget and foreign policy, or at least that part of the budget, um, and also our, our, our um, policy as well of dealing with other nations. I mean, how would you, as a, you know, a Congress person um, representing us at the federal level, um, so, I mean, if you're better than the other two choices as well, I mean, that's something to consider. Um, I mean, there are better choices, and, uh, and you know, you've been a mayor, and uh, that's good experience. And, um, uh, and so, you, you know, you, like you said, there are good ideas from, like, the conservative or and liberal point of views, but how mm -hmm. do you envision... Like, um, like, what would be our, uh, where, do, where would, should we hope to be um, if we have people uh, debating the right policies as far as foreign policy and the military and also the budget of the military? Well, I, I don't think we need to be uh, the world's police, police officers. Um, and, and I think that's, that's why uh, Ron Paul has so much support. Um, you know, we have bases where uh, you don't even know where we have foreign bases. We, uh, there's a, there's a, a super secret base in the, in the in middle of Australia. Uh, I mean, we have people based all over this, this world. And, uh, you know, anymore with the amount of military hardware that we have and the capabilities, it's kind of silly to have millions, you know, really hundreds of thousands of troops stationed all over the world. I, I don't, I don't really see that as as the United States' mission is to to uh, police the whole world. Um, you know, we went into Iraq and we straightened that out, and you know, I, we didn't get. It cost us money. We we should have worked a deal where if we're going to free that nation, we should be getting oil for probably thirty dollars a barrel for a long time to pay off that debt. That's not happening. No, so no, I, that's not happening. It you doesn't know. seem like. Um, and uh, all right, so I mean that sounds good, um, and that sounds good to the majority of the people. I think um, in polls, the majority of the people do want us um, to uh, be a republic and not an empire. I mean, there's we have bases in uh, Germany and in and, in and Korea and um, and lots of other places um, all over South America, um, probably all over Africa and the Middle East and and we could have some strategic islands and stuff, but nowadays we can really get to places uh, mm -hmm. within just a few hours or within less than a day, and, um, sure. and then we can use outer space and stuff as well um, to really get places super quick. Um, so a lot of, yeah, that stuff's not necessary. It's not really in our best interest. I mean, if we can't defend ourselves against special interests and no bid contracts, I mean, you know, how can we defend ourselves against, you know, these other nations? Um, and uh, what, what else about the budget, like Social Security, Medicare? What, what do you think? Um, uh, you, do, should we? Ha yeah, what should we do about those? Well, uh, the budget has to be balanced, and, and what I would what I would say we need to do is is go back and look at 04 levels of spending. Uh, in 2004, we, we spent about two uh, about 2.4 trillion uh, federally. And uh, remember, in 2004, we were fighting a war on two fronts. So we weren't spending a little bit of money. We were spending lots of money. Um, now, with the downturn, obviously, in the economy, that's, that's really put a kink in things. Um, but if we, if we look at going back to uh, 04 levels of spending, Thomas, in the last four, five, six, seven years, every city, every county, every state, has had to uh, reduce their budgets because of the ad valorem, the taxes going down. They've had to balance the budget. They, they, that's in their charter. They have to. With the city of Sebastian, we've gone from almost 200 employees four, four years ago down to 107 full-time employees, and we've lowered our budgets, and uh, we've balanced every year. So at the same time, the police still respond, the lights are still on, the parks are maintained, all the services that people have come to expect are still being provided. Now, people are working harder. There are some management folks that are wearing two and three hats. Uh, but in, it, basically what that tells me is we had too many people four or five years ago. When we had 200 employees, that was way too many. And so in that same time frame, uh, the federal government has grown just like a weed. So what you have with bureaucracy is, if you've read the Peter Principle, it's a long, it's an whole book, but it says basically that uh, you know bureaucracies tend to grow, 
and people feel more, they you know if you're a, a bureaucrat you feel better the more people you have underneath you and so the more layers of personnel you can put in your department the more you can get every year as far as an appropriation goes and it's just it needs to be chopped back yeah that I mean, the federal budget needs to be chopped back and 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 tell every department head what was your budget no for guess what that's what it is next year and let the pink slips fly uh, up in Washington. Yeah, that, and it seems like they have this incentive where they feel like, you, you know, they're if, if, if they don't, like, create a larger budget, then they're going to miss out on future budgets. And right. So that, that's like a horrible incentive to build in, to have built in. And it's just like some people feel like cops might have quotas. Well, maybe if there's less crime, I mean, it might be a good thing that maybe there's just actually less crime they shouldn't have a quote on how many speeding tickets or whatever they have to get so, mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of the same mentality though like uh, i mean every they're always trying to push the limit of the budget saying 2004 i mean that seems pretty reasonable uh, uh levels and social security i heard they you know can preserve it for decades to come if they just increase it one year like uh, uh you know and, and just have it sure. gradually go up a couple of months well here's the thing with social security first of all that i mean social security has been solvent uh, up until last year uh they were bringing in as much as what they were paying out now last year they didn't uh, that last in uh, 2011 was the first time that it didn't uh, bring in from payroll as much as what they paid out. But in the meantime, what's happened is they, uh, in all these years where there were surpluses, the government has taken that money. It, it was not, it was never in a lockbox. Sorry, Al Gore, it never was in a lockbox. They've put in treasury notes and IOUs in the in the lockbox. And so this is debt that the government owes itself. Um, and, you know, when Social Security was first instituted, the average lifespan was 65. So you weren't, you weren't sucking on that Social Security straw for very long, if at all. Uh, and now people are living to, I think the average age at the last uh, census was 77. So now we're taking, you know, from 65 to 77, that's 12 years of payout. So I think we're going to somehow have to index it to longevity, and you know increase the age at full be where, where full benefits are paid out, and that has started to happen. But uh, I think that that's there's there's um, certainly ways we can fix Social Security. Uh, the big problem is going to be uh, Medicare. We're going to have to uh, start collecting Medicare uh, taxes. I think uh, for higher incomes. Uh, or, and do something with Medicare because that's... Well, what that's about the, the Obamacare, as people call it, the Affordable Health and Something Act? I, I forgot the actual f real name yeah, of I it. I haven't read every 2,700 pages of that, but uh, there are some good parts to that. Uh, the fact of the matter is is that uh, uh, there has been some, uh, some savings generated with that, uh, but, you know, it's, it really needs to be... It wasn't bipartisan. They kind of just didn't, they just rammed it through. They rammed it so, through. They didn't even have, like, they did some kind of way of voting that they usually don't even do, and it was very exactly. questionable. I forgot what yeah. it was called, but, uh, yeah, they didn't have the votes. Instead of doing it, like, by a certain kind of majority, they used a lesser majority instead mm -hmm. or something. And so. Yeah. You know, yeah, there are some good parts to it. I mean, the fact that you can't be singled out for rate increases and the fact that now with, with this that uh, people with... Uh, pre-existing conditions can get uh, insurance uh, they can't be dropped uh, I mean there are there are some good parts to it however uh, there are some other parts that are not so good so you know it, it really uh, like, needs to have the mandate is necessary the individual mandates and do you think it's fair that some businesses are exempted while others aren't and no it's not the, the, if you're gonna have a mandate uh, you know that the I think Justice Roberts was uh, Chief Justice Roberts was probably right when he said it's tax, and that makes it legal. We can uh, Congress can tax and they can spend, uh, but uh, you know as far as making you buy it because it's uh, interstate commerce, whatever, that's ridiculous. So and nobody ever wanted to call it a tax, but that's in effect really what it is. Um, now some people in certain like uh, will be. Um, 
they'll make too much income to get any, um, you know, benefits from it, and then they'll make too little where they can actually afford it. There'll still be about, you know, a couple million people um, that won't get any insurance whatsoever, and it doesn't allow people to get just catastrophic insurance. They have to yeah. get full. Yeah, yeah, and that's and and that's that's one of the fixes we need we need to put in there because there are people that uh, should be able to say, look, I, I well, Mitt Romney. He shouldn't have to have that. I mean, he can self-insure. Why, why should he have to pay for that? You know, and there are people that are in that situation that all they need is catastrophic insurance. Uh, by the same token, there, there's a lot of folks that aren't going to buy insurance. And uh, we really kind of need to look at uh, another way of covering people because uh, we do have socialized medicine. If you look at the, uh, like the VA, uh, if you're a veteran, uh, you can go to uh, the veteran clinics. You can go to a veteran hospital, and you can get care. And uh, there, I mean, there's some good points to that. I would be in favor of expanding that that concept, and uh, instead of having people having to take out uh, $250,000 worth of student loans to go through uh, medical school, why not, kind of like the military, uh, put the gov let the government put them through, and then have them serve for five years or seven years or sometime in a in a hospital like of a, yeah, uh, like a VA type hospital. Great idea. And then after that seven years, they can, you know, start their own sure. practice and do whatever they want. Um, exactly. And then have a, uh, like a, a clinic type situation where somebody's uninsured and they're paying the fine or they're whatever you want to call it, the tax, then at least they can get care, uh, you know, like at a clinic. Box. I mean, so we shouldn't be necessarily beholden to insurance companies. I know they're no. very big. And, you know, here's the thing. The insurance companies love the Obamacare, so that's t that's telling you right there that they didn't do a good job when they put it together. Oh, yeah, there's stocks. I mean, here's another just idea I thought of once. Like, I saw this um, article, and I forgot which university it was, but um, I'll try to find the links. They um, invented some way of, instead of getting chemotherapy for cancer, they could pinpoint like to like a millimeter. So and say your whole body getting blasted with chemo um, radiation, they could just pinpoint it within a millimeter and then just more pinpoint it. And it was just some kind of weird seat that you would sit on and there's mm -hmm. these, um, like these radiation rays that were like swirling around you. And I mean, it's, uh, I don't know if we could do it or not, but I mean, it, and they said that machine costed like a million dollars or something like that. So, I mean, maybe a governor of a state could just buy one of those machines and then say you know everyone who has cancer that that this could help them with they could just pay like a thousand dollars a pop and 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 we could put one like in the northern part of the state one in the southern parts and then just um just you know it doesn't have you don't even have insurance you just pay like a thousand dollars and and you know and and then just mm -hmm. people from out of state can do it and just have like things like that possibly um but uh I mean, um, along, you know, whatever government puts money into, it seems like the prices go up. I mean, they put it into education, the prices skyrocket. They put in yeah. healthcare, the prices yeah. skyrocket. I mean, people used to be able to get catastrophic for a lot less, and um, like, um, and, and then maybe have some kind of savings account for like the deductible if they ever need that. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, and, and for people that are employed, that ha that are gainfully employed, and and they're making a good income, uh, that should be certainly an alternative. The problem that, that I see with the voucher system that uh, that the uh, Paul Ryan, or Ryan is talking about is that uh, a voucher system for Medicare, you know, is probably not going to work because by the time you're ready to buy that or get that voucher, uh, without capping the cost, the spiraling cost of, of medicine and uh, health care, uh, that's only going to allow someone to buy maybe a, a catastrophic product like a five thousand dollar deductible. Well, when you're retired, <laughs> you know you're not making that big an income. You don't have, you can't make up that five thousand dollars. You don't, you you need something like Medicare that's going to give you first dollar coverage. Um, so a voucher system, it sounds good as long as you have a good income coming in, it'll work. But for people that are retiring and looking to live on a fixed income, that voucher system is probably not going to be very good. Yeah, I think you're right about the costs. I mean, it's, it's nothing's going to matter if the costs keep going up, and um, and so it, it, healthcare is a huge cost. Um, that, that was a big bill that was passed. Um, I mean, it, do you think it's 
the responsibility of a business or an employer to, you know, provide insurance for people also. I think, you know, what you're saying about the clinics is one solution and then for Medicare for older people. But, um, I mean, do you think we should have a public option? Well, um, the only way that you're going to control costs, and nobody wants to hear it, but the only, and I was in the insurance business for 14 years, so I have a little bit of experience in this, and the only way you're going to control costs is with a, with, with a uh, single payer, uh, because otherwise <laughs> you're just not going to be able to put a cap on, on these uh, ridiculous prices that some of these uh, hospitals and, and clinics are charging. Uh, I saw a bill where a lady was charged $10,000 for a CAT scan. I mean, CAT scan is a glorified x-ray. Yeah. $10,000 for one test. That's ridiculous. It is. That's way ridiculous. Yeah, it, it's, um, so I, I kind of agree. I, I think it should be voluntary if there's a way we can make it voluntary. Um, I, I've heard um, people saying you, you can make it voluntary. I think a lot of people would participate, um, by the way. And I think this would be a boom for businesses. I mean, this would be a huge expense that a lot of businesses would no longer need to pay anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, sure. they could still offer it, and they might offer something even better. That's great. But um, it would help a lot of our businesses competing across the world, not having that added expense. There might be more money left over to hire other people. There would be a healthier workforce. Um, but it, I think there needs to be a sense of a free market in there. I mean, it, it just depends. Maybe something like smaller things like, more surgical, broken arms, whatever, flu shots, that can be handled by the free market. But, you know, bigger things, things that actually make people go bankrupt, um, mm -hmm. you know, there could be a public option. But, I mean, so you, it, there's a lot of good thoughts there. I think um, a lot of good debate that could be had. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so that's, um, so what about abortion, um, the, the right to life, the right to choice? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of different ways people look at it. But uh, how do you feel from, like, um, y you know, a congressional point of view? How you feel? Well, I, I, think that, I think that the federal government ought to stay out of people's lives, period. Uh, and right now it's, it, it is legal. Uh, at some point in time, uh, who knows? Uh, personally, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pro-life, uh, but uh, I, I really think that, that the federal government needs to stay out of people's lives. Yeah, I mean, we're gonna, we don't want to end up with, you know, abortions in back alleys again. Um, that's why the, the, the whole argument was probably went the way it did because of stories like that. And um, at the same time, we, you know, I think most people agree the status quo so far is not to have any federal funds go towards it. Um, and, um, and, you know, until we get some kind of revelation that, you know, where life actually does start or something, I mean, you know... Um, I think I kind of agree with that, too, what, what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, we definitely need to value life and not take it for granted either and start treating people like, you, you know, subjects or just like another number or whatever or, and, and be careful about cloning and stuff. You, you know, you can imagine. Well, let me, let me tell you a quick story. Uh, I, I recently read uh, a book uh, about the Steve Jobs, you know, the biography, uh, the biography about yeah. Steve Jobs. And uh, he was, a, um, he was uh, actually adopted. And uh, his mother was uh, impregnated by, I think, uh, her lover, who I think was possibly uh, a her teacher. Uh, anyway, she was in university and uh, she lived in a strict family, and uh, this was, of course, back in the 50s, I guess. And uh, she, uh, she made arrangements for adoption, and uh, he was uh, adopted by some folks out in California. And uh, when he got rich and famous, he tracked down his mother, and uh, he thanked her for not aborting him. Yeah, that, I, I mean, so... Um, you know, so, I mean, where would we be without <laughs> Steve Jobs? I mean, you know, there's, I think, uh, you know, adoption is a whole lot better case a lot of times than, than abortion, so... Uh, but again, I, I think that the federal government kind of needs to stay out of people's lives. And, yeah, and, and there can be a lot. I think it's more of a, one of those things like an education thing as well as um, just, uh, you, you know, we can just reduce the amount, too, by education. I mean, I, I, I think, um, like, I mean, 
just trying to imagine from a woman's point of view, like if someone was raped or the life and death of them, I mean, I think, you, you know, it'd be hard to argue that they wouldn't have those choices then. But, mm -hmm. but, but you know, yeah. it, it's I can understand both arguments on it, really. Um, and um, so what about the, um, do you think we should handle the war on drugs differently? And I ask this because right now i'm just looking at the facts we have the highest incarceration rate out of any country in the entire world a lot of that percentage is what could be classified as victimless crimes mm -hmm. which you know you could also throw prostitution in there as well it doesn't mean you support it or agree with it it's just that these kind of um activities have been going on since the beginning of time and 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 they just seem unenforceable um but um seems like more an education healthcare type issue than it does i mean there are a lot of families right now that are split up um uh par parents um split up from their kids uh husbands and wives split up um, mm -hmm. because of this and uh, it seems like you know there's really strict laws and seems somewhat of a freedom issue to a lot of people too i mean the government should just stay out of it should be regulated like alcohol but what what do you think um uh richard uh, about the um you know the drug war that was declared you know from since richard nixon's uh well uh they certainly haven't won it have they um <laughs> you know it's uh it, it's a real problem and I, and i think that uh it's it's really greater than even what most people think i think from from our perspective, uh, we we go in uh, once a, a month. We go in and do some work in jails, my wife and I. And about I would say 70 to 90 percent of the people that are incarcerated are there because of drugs or alcohol. Um, you know, it's either drugs or it's alcohol that caused them to be there. And th the problem here in Florida is there's no really there's no real other alternative. Um, if there was a, uh, you know, if there was another way of, of fixing those those folks or or getting them off of uh, alcohol or drugs, and of course when they're in jail, they're not they're not on them, so they're normal people. But uh, you know, there, we just don't have any any kind of uh, other treatment options, and. Um, that, that's a shame. I think that's why so many people are, are in jail. Yeah, we just think um, of a jail cell or, or, you know, free. I mean, there's nothing in between or nothing even totally different than either of those two options. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it costs like, uh, I think, average around the U.S. Some states might be cheaper and more, about $40,000 per inmate. Um, and um, that's more than, that's about the median income of the average, um, you know, citizen here. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I think even some kind of outpatient health care um, would be a lot cheaper. I mean, and plus the results would be a lot cheaper. I mean, these would be people that if they got, you know, some kind of positive um, uh, kind of education, um, then, uh, you know, they'd be less likely to do these things again in the future instead of mm -hmm. being put away with, you know, a lot of other people that would probably have a really bad influence on them. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh so yeah, just uh well, great. And uh so what are some of your um you know people that uh you know you've been thinking about that you'd like to share with us? I mean, just interesting people, whether they're someone you admire or or just I would just say interesting. They don't even have to be someone you admire um as of late, Richard. People that I I admire. Um gosh. Uh you know, I I I guess uh, I admire the, the, the people that are um, protecting our country, our, the, the veterans and the, the folks that are, that are uh, in the service right now. You know, we're, we're not drafted now. It's a, it's a voluntary service. Uh, and, and gosh, uh, the men and women of our armed forces are really uh, doing a wonderful job to protect this country. And I don't think they get enough credit. No and way. I, I don't, don't get any nears. I have to. I mean, I'm sorry. I just feel strongly about this. It's just, yeah. It's almost like people don't even realize. You know, they're so, um, I guess, satisfied or, or not, or just preoccupied with what they're doing um, that we, we forget. There's people that have been on tours, like, uh, like um, almost record number amounts and, and things like that. Yeah. I mean, they they go. They're there, and then they come home for a short period of time, and they're back, and. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's really quite an upheaval in the family when when the husband has to leave or the the or the mother has to leave and uh, uh, the family and and go over to Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever it is they're stationed, 
and be in harm's way. And Especially then, our National Guards men and women, too. I mean, yes. I mean, uh, and, and then for them not to be uh, given the, uh, the, you know, they have to uh, uh, wait to almost wait till they're shot at before they can return fire. I mean, some of the rules of engagement uh, that I've heard of is just they almost have to be. Uh, it's crazy. Yeah, you they're know, not I mean, meant to be a police force. I mean, we shouldn't no. make them into one. You know, they're, no, they're there just in case you need them, and they're supposed. And they did get the job done. It's just they're being asked to police and stuff. Now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, w well, um, Richard, I, it's been a pleasure. I, I see. I see. Like, um, you know, there's uh, definitely a, a strong third choice here in, in District Eight. Um, is there anything that we haven't gone over that you would like to share with? Um, the audience and, and, and people, um, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, when, when they're thinking about looking at that ballot this November, um, you know, maybe selecting uh, you or, you know. Sure. A couple, a couple things really uh, that are uh, passions of mine. One is term limits. They were not written into the Constitution, uh, Thomas, because, you know, when this country was founded, they were riding on horseback to Philadelphia or D.C. to vote. And this was not a never meant to be uh, an occupation. So they were paid uh, initially a dollar a day. <laughs> that's only if they showed up. So uh, this was never meant to be something where people would go there for 30 years and be a congressman or a senator for 30 years or 20 years a lot or of whatever. Them have never had a real job either. <laughs> well, yes, and and so I'm serving. I'm going in with a pledge that I signed a pledge that I will only serve for two terms. That's four years, and then I'm done. Uh, and so with, with me, if people like term limits, they get that, that in me as, as well. Uh, the other thing that I'm passionate about is uh, energy independence. We must get our country off of foreign oil, period. Um, you know, with this uh, tumult in the uh, Middle East right now, they're talking about the, the possibility of uh, oil going to four to $500 a barrel. If that's true, if that happens, we'll look at $4 gasoline and say, oh boy, remember when it was only $4? Because it'll go up to eight, nine, or 10 per gallon. And right now we have about a 100 year supply of natural gas underneath us. And if we could convert just the overroad truckers to natural gas, which actually you can burn it in a diesel truck uh, just with minor modifications, we would not have to import one drop of uh, foreign oil. So, I mean, that is, I have a national energy policy that's a draft that has been done by myself and uh, a professor that works on my campaign. We have forwarded that, and it's on uh, Marco Rubio's desk in Washington. So that's going to be my big thing when I'm elected is to try to get a national energy policy instituted that gets us off of foreign oil. Oh, I agree. That's, uh, I mean, everything from our groceries to uh, everything mm -hmm. because it, the shipping costs are, you know, directly related. And that's a good way of thinking about, uh, about it. Just like one sector, if they just get off um, oil, they, you know, you can change the whole um, paradigm. And I mean, just think about the military. If we could convert the whole military to alternative forms of energy, whether it's bio, sure. diesel or whatever it is, um, then uh, that could make a big difference um, because they use a big chunk of it. Um, I mean, Florida, we're the sunshine state. I know you're running more in a federal office, but I mean, maybe, you know, st I wish Florida would do something. We're, we, we could probably you know, to have a lot more solar here and, and other states, other things, but definitely, um, you know, as a sunshine state. But that's just a thought out there. Um, sure. Uh, R Richard, um, good talking with you today. Again, it's vote, uh, V O T E Gilmore, G I L L M O R dot com. Um, if you want to learn more, to find out how to uh, contact Richard, support, um, and, uh, you know, have some town halls um, and uh, Q and A's, et cetera. Is there, you know, so you're running against um, uh, those uh, Shannon, Roberts, Bill Posey. Is, can mm -hmm. we expect any debates soon? Or uh, yeah, Actually, next week on Tuesday, there's going to be, uh, in Brevard Community College, there's going to be a debate. Uh, it's going to be a, a forum. Uh, I don't know that it will actually be a debate, but we'll be asked the same questions. And that's at 7 o'clock, uh, and that will be broadcast on B BCC TV. Uh, so it'll probably be on the, um, the local access channel in Brevard. That would be channel 25 here in Sebastian. I don't know what it is in Brevard County, but Melbourne and 
some of the other towns in the district, uh, it'll be uh, it'll be broadcast that same evening at seven o'clock. Okay, so you're near, near Melbourne. Okay, that great. Mm -hmm. been there a few times. Um, yeah, kind of not too far from the space center, really. Really. Right. Actually, we we did a tour of that yesterday. My myself and my uh, my wife and my my campaign manager did a tour up at uh, Cape Kennedy. Cool. Uh, well, Richard, it's been a pleasure. I'll say goodbye to you right after this interview. And, uh, yeah, I, I see another strong alternative, a very, I mean, you know, someone I could totally imagine representing us um, a lot better than the other candidates, someone that, um, you know, even if you're not in the 8th District of Florida, you might be in another district of Florida where you don't have an alternative. I, you know, you might want to donate some time or, or money or, or whatever because... Well, I would love either one. <laughs> either one we'll certainly take because, yeah. you know, I've not, I've not received or taken a nickel of uh, PAC money, either corporate PAC or union PAC money, and probably don't expect to get any, but uh, well, it's a true crazy. grassroots campaign. Yeah, this is a way to hold these people accountable. I mean, maybe the end goal eventually is, you know, society will only need one golden rule. Um, but, um, you, you know, right now we are, if, if, if we let them, the, the powers that be, think that, you know, we're kind of endorsing them by not voting, um, I think, and I, I hate to say that because I do agree with the ideal of, um, you, you know, what people are saying, but I think it's real important that um, this November 6, 2012, we make a big impact. We can, you know, make a, just as strong of a voice, even stronger than the, the Tea Parties. It's kind of like a tea party. We're just throwing out. It the really is, members. and I, I think we definitely need a third party uh, just to e moderate the excesses of uh, both the other parties. If you had, you know, forty or fifty representatives there in Congress that were uh, that were not beholding to, uh, you know, uh, corporate PACs or or unions, they could really turn this uh, turn this thing around and just say, look, we're not going to spend money we don't have. Uh, just get over it, you know, and just put an end paradigm. to that. Yeah, I mean, it would, that would, um, that would, uh, you know, put the um, special interests on the run. They would know, you know, their time is getting close, and then, and then we need to envision, you know, what a better world this would be. I, I mean, it, it's, um, it's not too late. It's not too late for this country. We can get it back on track. Richard, thank you for your time. I'm going to say goodbye to you real quick um, after this interview, and uh, thanks again, sir. Okay, thank you, Thomas.